background. I used to work as a nurse and I was in intensive care for 17 years and that's where my interest in near-death experiences came from. And it was early on in my intensive care career when I was looking after a man who was clearly dying and that night shift had a big impact on me. I was just carrying out some basic routine nursing care and the man nearly jumped out of bed in agony and our eyes connected and it's almost as if I could understand what that man was going through and he couldn't talk because he was ventilated with a tracheostomy but he was mouthing the words to me let me die let me die in peace and that really did have such an impact that's all I could think about for the rest of the night shift and the following day I went home from work and I couldn't sleep I was just thinking of this man all the time so I phoned work about mid-morning to see how he was doing and they told me that he died about two hours after my shift ended. So that had such an effect that it, it caused me to have a bit of a depression really and I almost gave up nursing at that point. But I thought, I've got two choices, I can either walk away from this and do, or I can do something about it. And luckily I did choose to do something about it or try to do something about it. So I started reading about death and I came across near-death experiences and I thought, wow, these people are saying that death is a wonderful experience. And I think initially I was a little bit sceptical because my training as a nurse had been really scientific and I'd always kind of been led to believe that these experiences were just some sort of hallucination as the brain was shutting down. But the more I read about these experiences, the more I realised I was in a great position to do, actually study these and to do some research. So that's where my research came about. And I can remember when I first read about these near-death experiences, I reflected back to the time when I was a student nurse. And I can remember looking after a lady on a medical ward. And I'd looked after her for 10 days in a row. And on that 10th day, she'd, obviously she, we'd had a bit of a rapport and she started to really trust me. And she said to me, I'm going to tell you something now. But she said, you know, when I was in the coronary care unit and my heart stopped, I went to heaven. And I said, oh, right, tell me more. And she described this experience where she'd left her body and she'd looked down at herself and she could see her hair fanned out on the pillow. And she said she went through some darkness and she went into this beautiful garden and she met her mother, who was dead, and she said it was lovely, it was so peaceful. And then her mother said, you, you shouldn't be here. And all of a sudden, it went black. And she ended up back in the hospital bed, wondering what had happened. So that was the first time I'd ever come across an experience. And at the time, I can remember, I was thinking to myself, oh, she must have had too much diamorphine. And I never questioned her about it. And I'm kicking myself about that now. So near-death experiences are not new. They've actually been reported throughout history. And Plato, in the, the book The Republic, he describes the experience of Air, who um, woke on his funeral pyre 12 days after, his bo after he'd been killed on the battlefield. And he described going to this otherworldly realm. And then also Professor Carol Zaleski, uh, she's written a really great book back in the 1980s, and it's called Medi Otherworld Journeys, and that describes medieval kind of near-death experiences. So they're not new, they're all around us. If you look at the ancient artwork as well, William Blake, Hieronymus Bosch, um, Gustav Dore, they all kind of depict the imagery associated with the near-death experience. But it wasn't until 1975 when Dr Raymond Moody published the book Life After Life that these experiences really captured the imagination of the, the public. And Dr Moody classified these experiences as according to a set of components. So, for example, the experience can start with hearing the news of being dead. Sometimes they can hear the nurse or the doctor or a bystander saying that they've had a cardiac arrest or that they've died. The person may leave their body and look down on the emergency situation from above. They may go through a dark tunnel towards a very bright light. And this light, although it's very bright, it doesn't actually hurt their eyes. And sometimes it has like a very magnetic quality where they're very drawn to look at this light and, and to enter into it. And once they get into the light, they find themselves in beautiful gardens with lush green grass and vividly coloured flowers, sometimes a stream in the background and sometimes they can meet dead relatives or friends and sometimes it's even relatives or friends who they didn't know to be dead at the time of their experience. 
Sometimes they may meet um, a being of light, which could be associated with their culture. So, for example, they may in the West they may meet uh, Jesus, whereas maybe in India they would meet Chitragupta, the man with the book of deeds. So it is culturally influenced as well. And a very interesting component of the near-death experience is the life review. And this really fascinates me because with the life review, people describe actually reliving their life in great detail. And they see things, the significant things in their life and the insignificant things. And indeed, they see things that they'd even forgotten about. And very often with the life review, it can also be perceived from a third person perspective. And this is where it gets interesting because if they, they actually see what the impact of their actions have been on other people. So, for example, if the person has been particularly unpleasant to someone or violent to someone, they know what it's like. They, they step into that person's shoes and they can feel like what it's like to be on the receiving end of that unpleasantness or that violence. But conversely, if they've been particularly nice to someone, they can see the, the ripple effect of their actions and uh, it, they actually feel that niceness that they've given out to other people as well. So it gives them a very different perspective on life when they return. And then sometimes the person is usually sent back to life and saying it's not your your time or sometimes they feel that they, they are sent back with a purpose or a mission in life afterwards. Now not all near-death experiences are pleasant. There are some very unpleasant kinds as well and these are much more difficult to research because people don't like to talk about these. There's more stigma associated with them and people thinking what sort of person am I that I've had this but also the experience can be very, very traumatic. Just the recall of the experience can have some form of post-traumatic stress on people as well. The distressing ones have been classified as, first of all, the prototypical near-death experience, but it's interpreted in a frightening way. And then there's also, uh, the second one is the void experience, where the person feels that they're in this black, meaningless, eternal void. And sometimes they can hear voices in the background saying that life is just a joke. And one lady described it to me as eternal boredom. She said it was just boredom. She was just bored and couldn't get out of that state. <laughs> But then the third type is the hellish type of experience where the people actually feel like they're looking into hell or they're being dragged down into hell by demons. And that is the really distressing kind which can have lasting traumatic effects. And there's also a fourth category and this is where the person feels very distressed when they're reviewing their life. So in my study that I did in the hospital I actually came across two of the distressing kind as well. So the first kind that I came across, it was the, the first type, which is the prototypical experience interpreted very frighteningly. Now this lady, she said that she remembered leaving her body, looking down at herself in the chair, and then she said she's very much afraid of water, and she could see this bridge in the distance, and she was getting closer and closer to this bridge and getting more anxious about this as well. And she could see the water, and then she could hear like children's voices in the background as if they were mocking her. And then as she got close to the water, all of a sudden she just woke up and she was in her body. But she said she was convinced that she had been dead. The, th the second type, uh, the second distressing experience I got was the hellish kind of experience. And this lady started to describe the experience. And it started off where she was just on a lake in a r and she could see a lady in a rowing boat. And she said she didn't know this lady, but she had to stay away from her. And she said all of a sudden there were all these colours started spurting up around this lady and it was like very much like a Catherine wheel. And uh, she said then she could feel this tremendous heat and then she started to cry and she said I was looking into hell, I was looking into the flames of hell. And she started crying so much it was almost to the point of hysteria. So I had to terminate that interview because it was causing so much distress. And when I went to follow up this lady two days later, she didn't want to talk about it. She said it was just too painful for her and too traumatic just recalling that experience. So I think it's really important that we have a further understanding of these experiences so that we can help these people who have them. And there have been some cases in uh, the literature that have been documented where they've started off as very unpleasant experiences, but they have eventually turned into a, a pleasant experience.
And the, we don't know why some people have the pleasant kind or some people have the distressing kind. And it's nothing to do with the moral character of the person at all. Um, there's one school of thought that maybe it's about um, control of the ego and people are fighting the experience and perhaps when they re relax into the experience that's when it turns into a pleasant experience. We don't know really, we don't have enough research done on this aspect. But there are really quite amazing and profound after effects following a near-death experience but it can take many years to integrate the experience into the person's life. So. Um, some of the, I think the biggest after effect that they have is absolutely no fear of death. So the people say it's not that they want to die, but they know that when it is their time to die, it's nothing that they will be afraid of because they've already experienced it. Love and um, compassion and altruism towards other people as well. There's big more tolerance of other people, and there's a huge change in their values as well. And in fact, their values can change so drastically that many people decide to have a career change after this. Maybe they were used to a very high-powered career or something. After an experience, it's, it's quite common for them to change careers where they become carers or even trained to become nurses as well. Um, and there are some really fascinating after effects which really do fascinate me a lot. First of all, it's as if some people get like a great psychological boost after the experience. And the greatest example of this, which I describe in my book, I, this lady I, I refer to as Sally. Now, she, ha she was an amateur athlete and she had a really bad accident which left her with a severe head injury. She was in intensive care and her husband was warned that she probably wouldn't survive. But if she did survive, um, she would have to learn to walk again because of the extent of her injuries. Now when she was unconscious, she did have a near-death experience and she described this overwhelming love that was with her and this voice and a presence. And she said, this voice said to me, you have a choice, you can stay here or you can go back. But if you choose to go back, you will be stronger and she said that stayed with her and she doesn't remember making a decision she just remembers waking up in this strange place with all these people around her now she didn't recognize the people but they were her family and she had to learn to recognize them again and what is remarkable about this lady's case is that she did make a very good recovery and within a month of being discharged from hospital she actually ran a 10 kilometer race but further to that, she went on to become an ultra-distance runner. And this lady has been in the Guinness Book of Records three times. And her greatest achievement is running across Australia from Sydney to Melbourne, which is 625 miles, and she did that in eight days without any sleep. And she said it was that experience that kept her going. It's phenomenal, you know, it's incredible. So she said that voice was constantly with her. And whenever I talk to her, you know, she closes her eyes and she's back in that space. And very often she, she's very emotional. The after effect that people may have is they de could develop a psychic ability as well. They feel like they can read people's minds or um, they can just have these like <coughs> premonitions and things will come true after the experience. It's very much, sometimes it's described as downloading information as well, so uh, information that they weren't previously aware of. And some people develop a healing ability and sometimes they feel like their hands may heat up afterwards and, and they intuitively know where, where to put them on someone's body which will uh, very often resolve a physical problem that someone has. And I'd love to do more research into this because this could be very beneficial for future patients as well. And very interesting to me is electrical sensitivity. Now, after an experience, not all people, but some people can't wear a wristwatch anymore. They'll just stop working for them. And it could be a wind-up one or it could be a digital one. They just won't work anymore at all. And um, some people get problems with electrical items such as computers, kettles or toasters. And I witnessed this back in 2006. I spoke at a conference in Houston, Texas. And at the beginning of the conference, it was all the scientific papers presented. And then on the last day, it was people who'd had a near-death experience. They got up on the stage to talk about their experience. And what was fascinating was that as soon as these people got up on the stage, the microphones failed. They had to completely change the, the microphones. And there'd been no technical hitches at all. And the lights started to flicker and go on and off as well. So I actually witnessed that as well. 
So this is really fascinating to me, and I think I was still a little bit sceptical, and I thought, you know, I'm sure there, there may be some logical explanation for this. Is it because of the drugs that we give the patients? Is it because of lack of oxygen or high levels of carbon dioxide? So I wanted to sort of research this for myself. So in 1997, I commenced my own hospital study at the intensive care unit where I worked. I think when I started my research, I was really naive. I thought I was going to come back and have all the answers. But I think my research has raised far more questions for me than it has actually answered. So in 1997, after I got the... Uh, approval of the Ethics Committee, I began my research, and it was the UK's first long-term prospective study of near-death experiences. There was also a, another smaller study undertaken at the same time by Dr Sam Parnia at Southampton Hospital, and I was lucky enough to have some great supervisors for the research. There was Professor Paul Badham and Dr Peter Fenwick, both who were very experienced and knowledgeable about near-death experiences. So my data collection, it took five years, and it took me another three years to write it up and analyse it, and another five years to get over it as well, I think. <laughs> and basically what I did was I approached every patient who survived their admission to the intensive care unit. So that for the first year, regardless of how close to death these patients came, I approached everyone who survived, and I just asked them the simple question, do you have any memories of the time that you were unconscious? Most people didn't remember anything at all. And to be honest with you, after the first year, I interviewed 243 patients, and only two of them actually remembered an, um, having a near-death experience. And I found after the first year that I was spending far longer at, in the hospital than I was at home. So I couldn't sustain that research, so I had to modify it. So for the next four years, I just focused on people who had had a cardiac arrest. So these are people whose hearts had actually stopped beating, and they were clinically dead for a period of time. Now in this group, it's a much smaller sample. There were only 39 patients, but seven of them recalled memories during the time that they were unconscious. And in total, during the five years of, re of data collection, I came across 15 people who did report a near-death experience. And the general findings of the research that I did in the hospital was that the closer one comes to death, the more likely they are to experience the near-death experience. And I found that the near-death experience was very underreported. Out of the 15 cases that I came across, only two of those people volunteered the information. Had I not approached them, the other 13 people would never have spoken about it at all. And I also documented cases of hallucinations because I thought, you know, are these so, some sort of hallucinations? And what I did with, when I analysed the cases of the hallucinations, what I found was that it was all attributable to what was going on in the background as these patients were coming around from their sedation. But with a near-death experience, it, it wasn't attributable to anything that was going on in the background. And when I followed up the patients after six months or and a year later, the ones who had been hallucinating could rationalise that it was a hallucination, and most of them were quite embarrassed by their behaviour. But with a near-death experience, they were all adamant that it was real, absolutely real. I also looked at the theories, was it due to lack of oxygen? And I did come across a, a couple of cases where blood was extra extracted at the time they were having the experience, and the oxygen levels and the carbon dioxide levels were normal as well. So that didn't seem to be supported by the research. And I found when I looked at the drugs, if anything, the drugs that we give to the patients actually inhibit the experience as opposed to creating it. And of course, a lot of people say, well, it, that's just wishful thinking. Perhaps what, it's what we all wish for. We all want to be met, met by our relatives. But um, what I came across was, of course, there were two distressing kinds of, of experiences, which wouldn't be wishful thinking. And some people saw relatives who they didn't particularly want to see, and they didn't see the ones who they did see. So um, that was interesting. And I also tried to um, monitor the outer body experience as well and see if we could um, verify if this was correct. So what I did is hid symbols around the intensive care unit on the top of the monitors of each cardiac, uh, each cardiac monitor at the side of the patient. They were above head height and the only way you could see them was if you'd left your body. 
and unfortunately, although there were eight cases of out-of-body experiences, no one actually saw the symbols, and that was a lot of hard work because I had to damp dust them every week as well, so um, I didn't get any success with that. But what I did find was the eight out-of-body experiences that I came across, they were of varying different quality. So some people sort of raised about this much above their bed, some people floated in directions opposite to where the symbols were hidden, and the two people who were out of their body in such a position where they could have viewed the symbols were so interested in what was going on at their bed, their bed area and what we were doing to the body that they didn't actually look for the symbols at all. So it's a lot of hard work trying to verify this aspect and who knows if we will ever actually verify it. But I think it's certainly well worth pursuing. And it's ongoing now with the AWARE project, which is being run by Dr Sam Parnia, And that is a global project going on all around the world. Um, I'll just tell you very briefly about the strongest case in the hospital research that I did, and that was patient 10. Uh, this man had been in intensive care for some time. He was making a good recovery on, the t on this particular morning. And I was looking after him, and the physiotherapist decided to sit him in the chair, because it's very good, although he was still ventilated, it's very good for their posture and for their muscle tone as well. So we'd sat him in the chair, and shortly afterwards, I noticed that his breathing sort of, his pattern changed and he looked quite breathless. And then the monitor alarmed and it showed that his oxygen levels were actually dropping a little bit. So I got what we call an ambu bag, connected it to the oxygen point and connected it to his tracheostomy, squeezed extra oxygen in and I, it resolved that issue. But then his blood pressure began to drop and his heart rate went into a very fast rhythm and he started to go grey and clammy and I thought if I don't get this man back into bed now he's going to have a cardiac arrest in the chair so I called my colleagues we literally flung him back into bed by which time he was deeply unconscious he wasn't responding to deep painful stimuli or for us calling his name or shaking him and uh, I called the doctor who reviewed him we gave him some fluid and his blood pressure resolved and then after that, um, the doctor had to go back to another emergency. And shortly afterwards, the blood pressure started to drop again. So I ran out into the corridor while my colleague kept an eye. And the consultant was walking into the unit for the first time that morning. So I quickly grabbed him to come and uh, examine my patient, which he did. He shone a pupil torch in his eyes to check that his pupils were reacting. And um, we treated his, his blood pressure and that resolved. So the consultant went back to his office. After about half an hour, this man began to flicker his eyelids and move his limbs, all signs of uh, regaining neurological function. And then after about four hours, this man regained full consciousness, and he was very excited about something. The ward round were approaching his bed area, and he was trying to tell them something. So the physiotherapist got a letter board, and he spelled out, I died, and I watched it all from above. And the consultant said, oh, you'd better tell Penny about that then. And so he did, and he described leaving his body, looking down, and he described, correctly identified the consultant as, as examining him, but what the consultant did. He described me cleaning his mouth, and he also described the physiotherapist poking her head around the curtains, looking very worried and nervous. And this was true, and this actually did happen, and I, I know it happened because I was actually there. And all of these things go in the deepest part of unconsciousness. So he was describing a highly lucid state with great clarity and everything was very accurate. It's an interesting aspect of this case, which I kind of picked up on accidentally because he misinterpreted one of my questions when I was interviewing him. Now this man has cerebral palsy. He was 60 years of age at the time of his experience and his right hand was in a permanently contracted position like this. He's now able to open out his hand fully. Now, when he first showed me this, I didn't realise the significance of it. It was only afterwards when I spoke to uh, the doctor and the physios, and they said that shouldn't be possible. If his hand had been in that position from birth, he was 60 years of age, his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. So he would need an operation to release the tendons for that to happen. But he didn't have anything. I checked his physio notes. Had he had extensive hand physio? He hadn't, nothing like that. So that is one aspect that we don't understand, but it clearly has happened. And I've also got a signed statement from his sister to say that he's never been able to open out his hand as he has done. 
So I think if we understood that mechanism, we could then perhaps put it to benefit other people as well, so that they wouldn't have to go undergo surgery and things like that. So I think it's, there's so much importance from these experiences that we can really learn from. So there are many kind of other aspects of death, but I'm just going to focus on the, the uh, near-death experiences today. So a lot of my friends used to say to me, right, well, what's the point in doing all this research, Penny? What have you learned from it, you know? And they think, right, OK, from these experiences. Well, I think sometimes, you know, we've been so busy trying to pathologise these experiences and argue what they are and what they're not that we're really missing the important message that these people have to tell us. And one component of the near-death experience was the life review, which I described earlier on. And this really does imp uh, profoundly highlight our own actions on other people and the impact that it can have on other people. And when these people are having this life review, they have this deep sense of a unity and how we're all interconnected. We've been led to believe that we're all separate, we have separate bodies, but during that state it's as if they understand this deep interconnectivity. And the basic message of these people is treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And of course that's the golden rule and it's at the heart of all of the wisdom traditions. So it's not a threat, you know, this is just the way things are. And another big thing as well with that... Um, the effect of the near-death experience has on people is that they are more loving and compassionate and have more altruism towards other people. And I think this is, you know, really important because this is a very overlooked aspect of Darwin's work as well. You know, with Darwin, he believed that we evolved as a species because we have the capacity to love and empathise. Now, other species have this great agility and speed and strength and great fangs and things. Human beings don't have that necessarily, but we have this ability to cooperate and to empathise. And Darwin believed this was a very important factor in our evolution. But unfortunately, the bits of Darwin's work that we get to hear about are survival of the fittest. And when we, behave, when we hear about that, it's all we behave in selfish ways. It's all about me, 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 and we don't think so much of other people. But when we think, if we, if we believe and live from the perspective that we are all interconnected, we behave in very different ways to each other as well. And so following their near-death experience, people behave in very different ways towards other people, but also they have this knowledge of, or insight into how we are impacting on the, the, the planet itself. And many people actually be, begin to adopt very eco-friendly behavior as well. So can you imagine if everyone sort of had this new idea and this new way of thinking, how different our world would be? So I just want to finish off now with uh, the example of Christine Stewart, which is in the back of my book. And um, I like to finish off with this because it gives such a positive insight. This lady had her near-death experience during childhood and it has very much guided the way that she lives her life. She said, I was like most kids of 11, mucking about on my way home from school that day. I stepped off the pavement without looking into the path of an oncoming car and it hit me in the back. I was thrown across the road and I remember thinking that it was going to hurt. I heard a loud snap and I saw a flash, at which moment I was rising out of my body at rapid speed. I felt no pain as I seemed to lift higher and higher. It became dark and I was still travelling rapidly. There was an overwhelming sense of being loved, like the whole universe loved me. I came to a stop in, in front of some sort of barrier, which looked like a privet hedge. There were flowers growing in the hedge and they were huge, they were much bigger than my head. Beyond the hedge, there were people looking out at me. They all seemed very interested. Then there was the lady. I call her the Shining One. She was so beautiful. I knew immediately that she was hundreds of years old, but had the face of someone perhaps in their thirties. I was happy to be there. The feeling of love and peace was beautiful. You must return, the lady said, but I never once saw her mouth move. I went to object, at which moment I found myself in a great deal of pain back on the side of the road with ambulance men and a huge crowd of people around me. I learned quickly that my experience was something I should keep quiet about because folk looked at me strangely if I spoke about it. 
but I won't ever forget it, and as I grew older, I realised that many more folk other than myself had had a similar experience. That experience has helped me through some of the darkest times in my life. Death is not the end. If everyone had a near-death experience, there would never be another war, no one would starve or be the vic victim of violence, and greed would become a thing of the past. So let's not ignore these experiences anymore. Let's hear what these people have to say and share in their wisdom and insight. We can all engage with the message of the near-death experience and hear what these people are saying, and then we can all benefit from the wisdom of near-death experiences without having to nearly die. So I would like to thank all of the patients who are in my study and all of the people who have written to me and emailed me over the years, because they really have been my greatest teachers. And thank you all for your attention. That's a good question. And no, there doesn't really seem to be, because sometimes people can be unconscious just for a few seconds, maybe 20, 30 seconds, but they can have a really deep experience, which would take a few hours to unfold in real time. But then there are people then who are maybe unconscious for half an hour, and they have no recollection. So it doesn't seem to be linked to the amount of time that they were unconscious for. I've never had an experience at all, but I, f I feel very much changed in the way that many people who've had an experience are, just through studying them, you know, and it's had a huge impact on my life. But I've never actually had the experience. Mm -hmm. To do with our understanding of consciousness. And I think that um, now that we, we have all this great technology and people are, you know, Surviving cardiac arrest, far bit more, they've got greater success rates now. And I think it's more to do with our understanding of what consciousness is. And the view up until, well, it still is the current scientific belief, is that consciousness is produced by the brain. It's a byproduct of the brain. But I think maybe the brain mediates consciousness but doesn't produce it. And I think what makes more sense to me is that consciousness is around us all the time. It's eternal and it's always there but our brain acts like some sort of filter and it screens it out so we're not aware of it all the time. But there are times in our life when that filter action becomes relaxed and rather than the brain producing the experience, what's happening is this altered state or this consciousness which is around us is allowed into our everyday reality. And I think that makes far more sense then to explain these experiences because when we look at them from the perspective that consciousness is produced by the brain, well, they, they seem to be kind of paranormal or supernatural. But when you look at them from the perspective that consciousness is eternal and is around us, that is exactly what you would expect, really. It's, it would be quite natural for them. So um, I think what we're realising is we're, we're making, having a new understanding of consciousness. So to me, this is very exciting, you know. We, we've got you know, all this exciting research going on that we are making new discoveries about what it is to be human as well. So that makes more sense to me, anyway. Other kind of teachings as well, and yes, that's it. And so I think... Perhaps we've, we've, I don't know, we've had this notion that we're all separate and everything and this materialist view and perhaps it, it, that's run its course now and we have to look for other explanations which very much fit with all the ancient wisdom traditions. So. You know, the different spiritual practices as well, like deep meditation, you can have peak experiences. Perhaps these are all different ways in which we can help that filter action of the brain to relax. So I think there's many different routes to access in this altered state of consciousness. Do you think, do you think Something's going on in the brain which then facilitates this experience. Which, which meditation. Yes, that, that's right, yes, absolutely, yes. Do you know, and, and people have this lovely smile on their face sometimes as well, you know, so what they are experiencing is very, very pleasant, so, yeah. Mm. Well, I saw they stare, don't yeah. they, and, and it's a, a fixed gaze sometimes, and you, you go like that in front of their eyes, and, you know, they don't respond at all, it's just fixedly staring, so yes, it is. So I often wonder, you know, what people are, are seeing, because they can't often communicate it back to us, mm. either. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting because... Uh...